Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, like we said at the beginning of service, this is Christ the King Sunday. And I know you all are excited about that, that Jesus is your king, right? You might not have thought of it this morning, but that's an exciting thing to think about. And as Abby sort of said in the children's message, he's our servant king, right? He's, he's all powerful, but he also comes to serve us. And that's what I want to look at in the sermon today is what does it mean when we say that Christ is the king or Jesus is my king? What are we saying? Is Jesus a good king? Is Jesus a bad king? What, how does Jesus act as a king for you and me, right? Because we really don't have kings anymore. We have presidents and legislatures and things like that. But what does it mean that Jesus is our king? And to do that, we're going to look at a uh, story uh, that Jesus tells about the future when he comes back and he's reigning as his king. And I just read it for the gospel reading. It's the lesson of the sheep and the goats. And some of you maybe heard that and, and got a little uncomfortable because it's a kind of confusing reading. The gist of it goes this. Jesus says, when the Son of Man, which was a common term for the Messiah or Jesus, says basically when Jesus comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glory throne. He'll come as a king. Before him will be gathered all the nations. So every before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Nothing too bad yet, right? But then we, we, we jump forward a few verses, and the king will say, those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It's good, right? been blessed by the Father, inherit this kingdom that's been prepared for you since the beginning of all time, the foundation of the world. But then I'll look to those on his left, and I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody, but you're on my left here. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Ooh, right? Those on the right probably feel a little bit better, right, than those on the left. It's kind of scary, and we look at this, and, and we say, so what does this mean as Jesus as our king? If this is a picture of Jesus reigning as our king, is he a good king, right, blessing people to eternal paradise, or is he an evil king, right, condemning them to fires in hell? What, what, is, what does this mean? How does this fit into the rest of Scripture? Because this, especially here, can be really, really scary. Right, so, so how do we interpret this? How does this fit in what it, with what it means for Jesus to be king? And to be honest with you, if you Google Matthew 25, you'll probably get 15 different interpretations from people claiming to be Christians. It's a very, very confusing passage. And I think oftentimes we, we misinterpret Matthew 25. And, and to, in order to understand, I think a lot of times how we view this, I, I was looking at really medieval art from a couple hundred years ago and there's a lot of it dealing with Matthew 25 and and I found one of my favorites um, this is from the year 1425 to 1430 this is the sheep and the goats this is Jesus reigning as king I don't know if you can see this we're going to zoom in in a second but you see Jesus is up at the top right he's reigning right and right below him are the tombs right so everybody's been raised from the dead. It's the last judgment. And if you look to his right, you can zoom in a little bit more, and you see this beautiful paradise, right? There's all the saints there. There's, there's this beautiful garden, and there's this beautiful paradise, and, and that looks pretty good, right? But then you look to his left, and it's kind of dark, and you can kind of see. It's kind of hard to see on this screen, but if you look at the very bottom, there's like a little... Satan, uh, horned creature tormenting people, and just people suffering, and it doesn't look too pleasant, right? Right, so, so if you're looking there, where do you want to go? You want to go there, right? 
You don't want to go there. And if we look at this painting as a whole, what we see is it kind of begs you to say, where are you going to go? Right? You, you don't want to go to the left. You want to go to the right. And, and it sort of scares people into behaving a certain way. And, and, and certainly, this is sort of a Catholic painting back then, and it was basically, you guys better get in line. Because Jesus, your king, is coming again, and if, if you're not good enough, right, if you're not visiting people when they're sick, if you're not visiting people when they're in prison, if you're not helping those in need, you might want to watch out. Because Jesus might find that you're a goat, so, so you better be a good person. And if you haven't been a good person, Jesus, your king, he's going to come in vengeance for you. That's one way to interpret this. And I think many times, as, as we read this today, as they did 600 years ago, many times that's how we read this, and it's scary. We sort of make Jesus into this tyrant, this evil king who's sort of worse than Santa and his elves, watching what you're doing and what you're not doing. Just waiting to pounce on you and send you to the place of torment. Right, and it makes sense, because how does our society work? We are a performance-based society, right? Where if you perform well, you get a reward, right? If you've ever been in sales and you do good in sales, what do you get? A big commission check, right? We tell our kids, you better do good in school. Listen to your teacher. Do your homework. Study for your test. Because if you study for your test, you can make straight A's. If you make straight A's and you do well on the SAT, what does that mean? You go to the college of your choice, right? The University of Florida, right? That's right. No, I'm just. But you, you, you can, right? You go to the college of your choice. That was for me. And you do well there. You can go to the grad school of your choice, and then you can get whatever job you want in the world, making millions and millions of dollars, right? That's what our society tells us. We live in a performance-based society. This is you have to do good. You have to work hard. And if you do good and you work hard, then <laughs> you'll have all these blessings then you'll end up in eternal paradise. And we, we read this understanding into Matthew 25. This into our faith. And yes, if I'm just good enough to enough people, then God's going to bless me, right? If I get enough presents for the, the, the angel tree, if I get enough, uh, bring in enough bags of food for the food pantry, if I do enough good to those around me, then God's going to be really happy and he's going to be really pleased with me. And then Maybe if I'm good enough, right? This king that's up there in the clouds somewhere is going to grant me access to eternal life, this eternal paradise, right? And that's so many times how we feel. But is that how our king really acts? Is Jesus our king, this tyrant of a king that's up there in the heavens just waiting for us to mess up so he can send us to the bad place? Is our king up there in heaven basically with a, a tally mark, right? A, a naughty and nice list, right? Waiting to just say, you know, you could have been a little nicer there. You're going to the bad place, right? You're not going to the good place. Is that the nature of our king? Because so many times when we look at Matthew 25 and we look at our own lives, I think that's the, what, how we want to make our king out to be. But truly, how is King Jesus going to be when he returns? He is coming back, right? There, there will be a final judgment. There will be a great separation at the end of time. Don't get me wrong about that. Justice will come. Evil will be punished. But what's the role of our king in all of that? Is he a good king or a bad king? How is he going to come again? And in order to see how Jesus is going to come in his second coming, what nature he's going to have, I think the best way to understand that is to look at how Jesus comes in his first coming. And I think that's something that you and I are a lot more familiar with. We have 30, or not 30 more days, we have one month, right? And so we celebrate the first coming of Christ. That's Christmas. And when Jesus comes in his first coming, how does Jesus come? Do you picture him angry? Like this tyrant waiting to send people to the bad place? Is that how Jesus comes at Christmas? Right? That's your favorite Christmas show, right? Jesus will send you to the bad place, something like that? No. How does Jesus come? He comes like a servant. 
In fact, even before Christmas comes, there are all these prophets that talk about the nature of Jesus and how he's going to come as a shepherd or as a king. And one of those prophets was a guy by the name of Ezekiel. And this is what he says about Jesus way before Jesus even comes the first time. He says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Ezekiel says God himself is going to come be the true shepherd. He's going to be the one that, that's dealing with the sheep. He himself is going to be the one that, that, that's dealing with the sheep and the goats. And what does he say he's going to do? He's going to rescue his sheep. He's going to pull them back to himself. Right? That's exactly how Jesus comes. Jesus comes to rescue. That's the nature of our king. He's a servant king. Right? He's born on Christmas Day in Bethlehem to this poor family. And he serves. He loves. He forgives. Certainly he calls out sin. Right? He's not okay with sin. He calls out sin, but he calls sinner to repentance. Right? He doesn't send them to damnation. He sends them, calls them to repent and trust in him. And he becomes the servant king. And if we look at the Gospels, how Jesus lives, he lives this life of this king. Right? He goes to these horrible sinners, these chief tax collectors, like a guy by the name of Zacchaeus, and he says, hey, I'm going to stay at your house today. And when he's there dining with Zacchaeus, and everybody has a problem with this so-called servant king eating with sinners, Jesus says his purpose, the reason that he's there, is to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus as our king, right? He, he doesn't come with this, this gold crown, right, and this sword aimed at you and me. But rather, he's crowned at the end of his life, finally, but it's with a crown of thorns, where he himself doesn't aim a spear at you, but takes the spear for you and me in our place. He's a king that, that finally is raised up to his throne, but it's not a glorious throne. It, it, it's the throne of a cross, a couple pieces of wood, and he's nailed to it. And as he's there, he's there with mere criminals. He's hanging next to sinners. Yet one of them cries out to his king Jesus as he sees him suffering and dying. And one of these criminals hanging next to him says, Hey, Jesus, please remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you are fully reigning as your king. And remember what Jesus says to him? Sorry, buddy, right? You haven't done enough good. You're going to the bad place. No. That's not what our King Jesus says. When our King Jesus is reigning, he looks to that sinner who is looking to Jesus as his king and trusting in him and says, Truly, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the nature of what our King does. He's a good king. He comes to serve you and me. He comes to rescue you and give you the promise of inheritance. And this is really what Matthew 25 is all about. You can't just pull Matthew 25 out of the whole Bible and put a whole different meaning on it. You've got to read it in context with who Jesus is and what he has done, and it makes perfect sense. Look here at Matthew 25, what it says Jesus is going to do once again. Right, this is Matthew 25, 34. We looked at this already. It says, Then the king will come and say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Is that something that they're doing, working to earn? No, it's a gift. It's a gift from the Father, given to his sheep, given to his people, who have been blessed by the Father. So he says to you, all of you, you are God's sheep. Because Jesus has died and been raised for you, he gives you the, the, the keys to his kingdom. You have been blessed by your Father. 
inherit the kingdom prepared for you. It's a gift. Right? You don't have to work to earn it and deserve it because your King Jesus is a good King. He comes to serve you. He comes to die for you. He comes to be raised for you. Right? It doesn't matter how many bags of food you bring in, how many times you're nice to your neighbor. Sure, those are good things to do, but your King Jesus has died for you and been raised for you. He's paid the penalty for your sin. You are his child. You are his sheep. So come, you who are blessed by his Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. You're going to the good place. Jesus is bringing you into the good place as your good king. Right? So what about all these good things that Matthew, or Jesus talks about in Matthew 25? Well, if you look at it, right, he says, you know, you need to visit those in prison, visit the sick. But look what the sheep do. Are they doing it for credit? If you look at how he describes it, it says, Then the righteous, those who have already inherited the kingdom, will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Are they looking for credit as they're doing good things? No. They're simply doing it because the kingdom has already been prepared for them, because that's what sheep do. You could say they have a good king and they are ambassadors of his kingdom to the world around them. That is true for you and me. You are a sheep because of what Jesus has done. Therefore, we go, right? We visit the sick. We visit the poor. We visit those in prison. We bring plenty of bags of food in. We bring gifts in for those in need because that's what sheep do. Because the kingdom has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You are in because of Jesus. And you are an ambassador now of that kingdom to the world around you. You have the privilege of going and doing those good works for your neighbor. Jesus doesn't need them. God doesn't need them, but your neighbor does. That's what Martin Luther would always say. So today we celebrate that Jesus is our king. He's a good king. He's a servant king. He's a king that has brought you into the promise of his paradise. So go live in his kingdom, being an ambassador for that king to all those Knowing that you are here. Knowing that you are. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, the life of all lasting. Amen. At this time, we'll take a few moments to collect our gifts of love, that the Lord might continue his service here in Tampa and beyond. Thank you very much.